I want to start by acknowledging Uncle Dave. Um, thank you for your welcome to country. And also I want to acknowledge the traditional owners um, and custodians of the lands wherever you're joining us today and pay my respect to those elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. It was now and will always be Aboriginal land. And I also want to say it's a great honour to be invited to be part of this panel and to join what is a very impressive panel, including public housing tenants. Uh, in so many of these debates and discussions, like Adam said, we don't often hear from tenants themselves and, and someone who's participated in a great number of these discussions. It's good to see um, a panel that actually includes tenants of public housing as part of the discussion. Um, also want to acknowledge um, the other speakers here today, including Max Chandler Mathers. I've enjoyed working with Max and his um, commitment to, to public and community housing is to be applauded. And also to acknowledge fellow Canberran, who I just uh, met Lilia as well. It's good to see another resident of the ACT here on the panel today. Finally, I want to acknowledge Paul Keating and the mighty Sydney branch of the MUA, fellow comrade uh, Paul Keating. As many of you know, the CFMEU and MUA recently joined forces to form a new, stronger, amalgamated union. Um, we both share a rich history and tradition of taking it up on behalf of our members, but also the, more, the working class more broadly. And I know, like Paul, um, is like myself, in that we're proud to walk in the footsteps and the history and the tradition of our union. And that both our unions and the predecessor unions that came before the CFMEU and the MUA have a rich history of fighting not just at the gate, not just on the work site, but in the community um, and fighting for the working class um, more broadly. And if you look around this room, you can see the legacy of that rich history and that rich tradition. You know, we are the union um, that during a party stopped loading ships to bound to South Africa. We're the union that, you know, a short walk from here um, fought and saved low-income housing at the Rocks uh, in other places in Sydney. We're also the union that fought and won the eight-hour day um, and, you know, the stonemasons that won that. And similarly, we're going to win the fight to ban engineered stone, which is killing our members at unprecedented numbers right now. So the, the topic is housing solutions. And there are a number of solutions that I could talk all day, but I really want to focus in on one solution um, that our union's been putting forward. But first, I just want to set the context as to why our union, the CFMU, the MUA, our amalgamated union came to this point. And the starting point for us is um, we are, as a nation right now, allegedly twice as rich uh, as we were in the 1980s. If you measure us on GDP right now, we are twice as rich as we are now as we were 40 years ago. But how can we say that? How can we genuinely say we're twice as rich as a nation when we can't put a roof over every Australian's head? How can we say we're one of the most developed, wealthiest nations in this world when we can't even afford the basic standard of dignity? to every single Australian. How can we say this when millions of Australians are currently in mortgage and rental stress? How can we say this when another 150,000 people today actually woke up experiencing homelessness? How can we say this when we've waged a war that's lasted at least for four or five decades against public housing, which has been waged by governments of all political persuasions? Now, from our point of view, an economy is meant to serve the society, not the other way around. There is no greater failure of our economy right now than our ability to put a roof over every Australian's head. There is no bigger canary in the inequality coal mine than the current housing crisis and our failure to, to house every Australian. So we funded independent economic research and it really said what everyone in this room already knows. We didn't find anything new, but I think the magnitude, I think, scared even some of us in our union about how big this crisis is and how big the problem is right now. To build the housing that we need, we need half a trillion dollars over the next two decades. This comes off the back, like I say, of a four-year war of attrition against public housing, a four-decade four war of neoliberal values saying that the state has no role to play and what we've left with is now a 750,000 deficit in homes in this country. And that's going to grow to 950,000 over the next two decades. And like I say, the cost of building that's half a trillion dollars. And that's even when you factor in all of the government's current proposals, federal, state and territory governments. When you factor it all in and you factor in all the backpacking, all the slaps on the backs, all the congratulations, 
that governments like to give themselves at the the moment for fixing the housing crisis. And that's not to detract away from what are some very worthwhile programs. But the problem is still going to get worse. The gap in housing in this country is still going to grow. $500 billion is half a trillion. We sometimes get immune to the size of that money, especially when we're talking about nuclear subs, like you said, that are worth the same amount. But that is serious money. That is $28 billion a year that we need to be spending on housing to close the gap. And so we asked ourselves, how do we raise that money whilst causing the least amount of pain to the majority of Australians? And the answer to us is clear. It's a super profits tax. We need to tax where the wealth exists and to fund public housing and community housing in this, in this country. Now, I said before that we're twice as, twice as rich as a country, but it doesn't seem like it. It doesn't feel like we're twice as rich as a country. But the wealth does exist. The money does exist, right? So it's not like this wealth um, is an enigma. It does exist. The problem is, though, all of that wealth, all that money has been created on the balance sheets of a small and elite group of companies. This is why we're calling on a super profits tax. The tax that we're proposing would only affect 0.3% of businesses in Australia. Yet that 0.3% in the first decade alone could raise $290 billion to go straight to public housing. That fact in of itself, that statistic in of itself, I think uh, is a sign of how much um, neoliberal economics has failed us and how much inequality has been able to run rampantly in this country when you can tax such a small elite group of companies, still maintain shareholder returns. We're talking about super profits here. We're not talking about the ordinary profits of business. We're talking about those excessive profits like the likes that the banks and the supermarkets are enjoying. And we can fund public housing for the tune of $290 billion. The fact that we're in that situation, I think, speaks volumes. Now, this is a long-term campaign. We know that it's not going to be won overnight, but it's a campaign that our union, our amalgamated union, is committed to. Because like I said, our union, its rich history, is not about just fighting for wages and conditions and fighting for outcomes industrially in the workplace, but it's also about fighting for a better Australia for all workers and for the whole of the community. It's a campaign about redetermining housing as a right, not a commodity. And I think so much of the problem we have at the moment is now is that housing is seen as a commodity. And we can thank the legacies of things like negative gearing, that we now, as a society, treat housing as a commodity, as an investment class, not as a fundamental right. This campaign is, holding, is about holding both the major political parties to account too. Both are captured with the same tired neoliberal thinking, which has failed working people. This campaign is about saying the wealth does exist in our country. It exists within this small elite cabal of companies, like the banks, who have recorded record profits, while most Australians are struggling to put food on their table and put a roof over their head. It's the same elite cabal that includes supermarkets whose profit margins increased over COVID when they gouged ordinary Australians at a time when most people were doing it the hardest. So we have the money to fix this problem, and that's what this campaign's about. We have proposed a mechanism, but really what we're saying, if we want to get serious about housing, or we have to get serious about housing, because nothing is more fundamental to the basic standard of living, to dignity of all Australians and being able to put a roof over your head, then we have to get serious about tax. We have to get serious about the redistribution of wealth, because the money does exist in our society. We just need to be more courageous and we need to embrace the role of the state again. One of the legacies, I've talked about the last four decades of policy in this space on housing and taxation, one of the legacies has been that the state is seemingly got no role to play anymore, that the idea of the state as an actor in housing and taxation has been minimised. Well, it's nonsense. And I think now more than ever, people are looking to governments to actually act more boldly than they have before, to embrace big reforms and to say that they will raise the money by taking on these corporate behemoths and once and for all uh, funding public housing and putting in place, I suppose, a longer term, more sustainable solution to how we fund housing in this country. So I'm just going to start with Kerry. Um, 
if you're still with us, I can't see you online, but um, just to come to, so is it Kerry um, from Barrett Beacon? Um, so just very quickly, um, in response to your first question about public versus social and affordable housing, yes, absolutely. Um, I think it's a very important point you make. Um, I think it's something my union and other unions um, <coughs> could do better at is talking about public housing um, over social and affordable housing. It is an important distinction to make. I just want to say one thing on this. Um, I just wanted to call out um, Riley for um, their contribution. Um, I know an organiser, he's a veteran organiser of our union, 30, 30 years um, he's worked with our union. Um, his father was an alcoholic. Um, he was admitted into social housing, or what would be now called community or social housing, um, on the condition he stayed off the bottle, off the drink. Um, and there was a bunch of other sort of conditions and standards that were put on him. Um, he was found drinking um, first time, you know, falling off the wagon, was evicted from his housing, was homeless and within three or four weeks was dead, um, having lived on the street. And to me, you know, people sometimes say, well, social housing includes public housing, but, it, you know, it's an important distinction to make because of that discrimination. I know, Riley, you were talking about different forms of discrimination, but I think the point is just as valid that, you know, the importance of public housing is that it doesn't discriminate on the tenants and um, their, their circumstances. So, yes, firstly, to that first question, very good, um, and I think very, um, something that we all need to take on board in the union movement uh, in our use of language. Uh, and secondly, uh, a meeting with the CFMEU, if I can get your details of someone, I'm the National Secretary of the Union, so I'm happy to meet with you. I travel all around this country next time in Melbourne. Absolutely keen to meet with you. Um, Sylvie, um, I think Sue may have said it, one of the other speakers or someone who asked a question, we do support inclusionary zoning. Um, I think there's also a place for super funds. Now, uh, many in this room um, would be critical of super funds um, and the, the, the place of superannuation versus, say, a pension scheme. Putting that to a side for a second, we currently have a system of superannuation which funds retirement. It owns billions of dollars, if not trillions of dollars, of workers' money. Um, that is workers' capital. Um, and, you know, I think there's a place for that money actually being put to um, the betterment of the working class rather than just being, you know, invested in different asset classes which generate wealth for other people. So I think superannuation is an important part to look at when we talk about other sources of funding. Although, although I would just say our primary campaign focus is on taxation, public revenue raising to fund public housing. Um, I wanted to address, I think, the strategy questions um, at large, um, because I think there was um, a lot of sort of common points here. So uh, just picking up on points that Cherish, Priya, um, Declan raised. Um, I, I might just start with Declan first. Look, I, I get your anger and frustration. I think you're right to be critical of the outcome at ALP conference. Um, I'm not gonna sit there and say that's what the union wanted or what I wanted personally out of the ALP conference. The reality is, and the truth of the matter is, the union didn't have the numbers, not even amongst other trade unions, to get our full position up at this point in time. That, that's the reality. Um, that doesn't mean we give up, though, and that doesn't mean we walk away from the fight. And I think that really was what your question is, what does the fight look like next, and, and questions of direct action. I think direct action is important. Um, things like green bans are important. I'll come back to green bans in a second, and other forms of direct action are important. But one thing for me as a union leader, um, that we haven't really spoken about today, um, but I think is necessary and it sets the basis and predicates any effective direct action is political education. Mm. So I get around and talk to workers, right, um, all across this country. And a lot of our members have done pretty well, thanks to the CFMU, thanks to the MUA, thanks to the conditions we've won them. Um, a lot of them are on you know, $100,000 plus. Um, and what has happened, and this is both sides of the, the political divide, have generated this is a political narrative and a commodification of housing, which means that the working people in large degrees have been co-opted into acting selfishly and ultimately acting against their own class interests. Mm. Um, and I think one thing that my union and other unions haven't done enough of is political education and talking to their members and talking to workers and just, you know, um, the working class about taxation, about housing, about the issues we've been talking about today. Um, many of my members, many of the CFMEU's members, um, 
lack that awareness, lack that education. So yes, direct action is important, but you do not man pickets with just officials from the union. You do not man community protest and green bands. We can talk about putting green bands or whatever we want, but if you don't actually have the people to put on the on the picket line, then they're not then they're going to fail. And the success of actions that the union has taken in the past, whether they be picket lines, um, and you know, I was talking to Keto um, just before about picket lines he's run for four and a half months, is that ordinary workers, members of our union, the working class are on the picket line. And so direct action has its place, green bands have their place, but political education um, needs to happen. Now, sorry, I'm gonna run a little bit over three minutes, sorry, Adam. Um, I think, Sue, it was yourself, um, that talked about um, preoccupation. I think it's true. I think the union movement has been has suffered from preoccupation. Now, I talk about my own union, for instance. The last ten years, we haven't exactly, you know, it's been attack after attack from the conservative governments, um, office raids, arrest, jailing of, well, not jailing, but arrests and criminal charges against officials, royal commissions, all this sort of stuff. And I think one of the effects of that, apart from the immediate demonisation of unions and the draining of union resources, and that's even before you get to the ABCC, is that unions have become preoccupied in those sort of battles. Um, we lost our focus on housing. The CFMEU and before us, the BWIU, the BLF, the predecessor to unions, the CFMEU, had a strong political and social position on housing. We talked to our members about these issues. We were engaged with the rank and file, talking to them about housing issues. We lost that, we got preoccupied, and that was a result of conservative tax. And, you know, I will say this too, when I talk about conservative governments, Rudd and Gillard kept a lot of those mechanisms in place. So that's not just directed again at one side of politics. And so, yes, green bands are important, but not without political education and not without, you know, unions like myself returning to the rank and file and having those conversations. The other thing I'd say too about green bands is the success of green bands, and some of you would have been involved in them. Some of you here would have stood in those, um, in those fights. The successful ones had community support. It wasn't just like a union secretary sat at their desk one day and said, we're gonna, we're gonna save this project or, or enact this action. It was community action where the BLF came in behind and in support of the community and there was partnership. So in terms of any green band, I'm happy to meet with any activists here, any community group about how our union can support through direct action, any campaign, but it needs to be done in partnership with that community organisation, with the tenants, with the people in the community, and it can't just be something that the union imposes from on high because it never works, and history shows that that sort of action never works. I um, want to make one other observation and one other perspective on, and so, sorry, just I'll just finish that by saying that's an open invitation to any activist in this room or any sort of community, oh shit, uh, any, sorry, any community organisation in this group, in this room, that that's an open invitation from our union to engage on, on how we can meaningfully support through direct action. I just want to uh, offer one other perspective on this issue of maintenance of public housing, because there's been a bit of talk about refurbishment versus demolition, retrofitting of buildings and all that. Uh, our members are also the workers who maintain public housing. Um, and one thing we have seen across the board is outsourcing of maintenance of public housing and a deterioration in services. So there are many public housing estates and many public um, uh, many public housing um, buildings around this country which are, for the use of an old language, condemned. Basically, people shouldn't be living in them. And it's a very deliberate strategy where governments have defunded and outsourced the maintenance of public housing. And so. In the ACT, for instance, um, talking to public housing, that's where I live, we talk to public housing tenants who've got black mould in their, in their um, units where they're living there with their kids. Now, for those who aren't aware, black mould is cancerous. It will kill you. And people are expected to live in it. It's dehumanising. Um, and what's happened there is that those services used to be provided by the ACT government. They used to employ carpenters. They used to apply, uh, employ people that maintain that. And then they've handed it over to, I think it's programmed, but you know they're all sort of one of the same, Circo, programmed, spotless, one of those sort of faceless, massive multinational corporations to maintain public housing. And what's happened is they've let it run down into rack and ruin because they're not interested in maintaining those buildings, they're interested in their profit margin. And so one part of this campaign for us too, and something that the union talks about is not just 
building public housing, but the public, uh, the government maintaining public housing and maintaining to a standard that the politicians themselves would feel comfortable living in. And so uh, I just think it's an important perspective from a working class point of view, from a trade union point of view that, uh, and it is a bit of intersectional, <laughs> intersectionality there between um, you know, the industrial interests of, of working people and the maintenance of these facilities for the public. And again, I think there was a comrade at the back there that talked about outsourcing and privatisation, and yet we see again how it rears its ugly face. And I think that's an important part of when we talk about public housing. It's not just good enough to build it, but governments also need to give adequate and proper funding into the future. So again, I want to thank you all for your time to here today. And I think it's impressive the number of activists, um, uh, elected representatives, tenants, um, organisers, unionists, um, such a wide variety of people that are in the room today. Because it's through groups like this that we will see change in the long run. And again, I just want to thank the organisers for inviting me. It's been an honour to, to be able to address you. I look forward to the debate. Thanks.